and welcome to the sixth talk in Planted Country's Save Our Soil programme, brought to you in partnership with the National Trust and filmed on the deck of our beautiful off-grid cabin crafted by our friends at Out of the Valley. My name's Sam Peters and I'm one of the co-founders of Planted, the only design event aimed at reconnecting people and spaces with nature. At Planted we aim to make the commercial case for nature and we'll be discussing how food, farming, architecture, design and nature can combine to create a cleaner, greener and more sustainable future. In this series of talks we're exploring why the earth is important for food, farming and nature and asking what role design can play in encouraging the use of local materials while reducing demand on our already overstretched natural resources. Today we're talking about farming and the future of it. Our farmers have never been under more financial pressure, with margins squeezed by supermarkets, meanwhile habitual use of chemical fertilisers and overplowing, driven by our demand for ever cheaper food, have decimated nature and damaged the soil to the point where the UN has suggested we have as few as 60 harvests left before the land becomes barren. So how do we turn things around? How do we encourage and enable people to eat locally produced food at affordable prices while making sure our farmers get a fair price to live? And how do we bridge the divide between town and country, emblematic of our disconnect with how our food is produced? And to help answer these critical questions, I'm delighted to welcome another wonderful panel of expert speakers to guide us through this challenging subject. Firstly, to my left, Tim, Tim Martin from Farm Wilder. Tim is an award-winning filmmaker and passionate naturalist who, after years of frustration at the relentless decline of British wildlife, set up the community interest company and non-for-profit organisation Farm Wilder, which works to make farming more sustainable and better for wildlife. To Tim's left, Joe Oborn from the Farming and Wildlife Advi Advisory Group, also known as FWAG. Joe has worked with farmers in the Somerset area and beyond in Devon and Dorset for more than 25 years. She is qualif a qualified crop agronomist and specialises in practical advice on soils, nutrients, manures and sustainable crop rotations. Anna Jones, to, uh, to Joe's left, from BBC Countryfile and author of Divide. Anna is a freelance TV producer and director, radio producer and presenter, writer, blogger, Nuffield farming scholar and public speaker. Very busy. <laughs> <laughs> the daughter of a farming family, Anna previously covered rural affairs at the BBC directing BBC One's Country File, producing and presenting Radio 4's Farming Today. And Anna's first book, Divide, explores the gulf between urban and rural life. This was published earlier this year, and Anna will be signing copies in the Fold Bookshop after this talk, before staying in our off-grid cabin tonight. So uh, Anna's got a lot on her plate today. Uh, but thank you all for being here, guys. It's an absolute pleasure to welcome you here. You. Such a privilege for Planted to have so many amazing people with so much knowledge. Um, to join us and to explore these really important subjects. So thank you. I'm excited to get this going. So perhaps if, if I can start off, Tim, you, just because you're closest, um, what's gone wrong with the way we produced our food? What, what are, the, in your view, the fundamental problems confronting us right now? I think I mean, the fundamental problem, as far as I'm concerned, is cheap food um, and farmers being forced to produce food ever more cheaply and what's been squeezed out is the environment so wildlife and sustainability soils all the things that have gone wrong with farming have come because farmers have been trying to produce food more and more cheaply and it's not their fault it's our fault as consumers because we go to the supermarket we get the best deals and that's what's that's what's killing wildlife i mean if you look at many fields um, I mean, it's, it's easy if you go to East Anglia or somewhere, you see great massive areas of, of, of um, barley or wheat. You can tell that's not very good wildlife habitat as you watch the sprayers go out. But it's the same in this part of the world around here. You see beautiful green fields. People think green is good. Actually, many of our fields are way too green because they're artificially fertilised, um, uh, all these chemicals. And they, they are terrible for wildlife as well. They're just as barren as a, as a wheat field. They're a monoculture. So in many fields you'll see it's just ryegrass and that's it and they're designed to be fertilised and sprayed, and there's no room for wildlife. And to, to add to that, everyone's got very into being tidy, so farms are all tidy, little hedges, very low, overcut, um, and no little rough areas for wildlife, very little habitat. So the countryside has just become this kind of organised, mechanised, chemical-drenched thing where there's no room for wildlife and there's no sustainability. So that's, that's what's gone wrong. And as I say, it's not the farmer's fault, it's the fault of society the way we work, we as consumers going to supermarkets and buying cheap food, basically. Joe, can you take that on a little further and explain 
what's going on beneath those sort of artificially green fields that we see? What, what, what's the sort of effect that those chemicals have on the soil beneath? Well, I think sort of one of the problems um, that Tim's just gone on is monoculture. Nowhere in nature do we find, um, if you look around in nature, you don't find uh, a monoculture anywhere. It's all diverse communities. Uh, with soils, of course, because people have become, um, we're asking more of the land, we're asking more from it. Every time you cultivate the soil, you're burning all of the organic carbon there. Um, and carbon in the soils is just the sort of, the fuel for soil biodiversity. So if you're losing carbon, you're losing biodiversity within the soil. And there's a great big party of soil biology on, going on between us. Um, beneath our feet, um, which are basically recycling um, all of the nutrients and bits and pieces that are going on um, under there, and it's just a living community. It's like recycling everything. When you're putting fertilizer on or putting in ryegrass, ryegrass is being bred just to respond to um, applied nitrogen. So it's really lazy. It just says, sits there and says, feed me. So we've got onto a sort of a treadmill where we're growing crops which need more inputs. Um, and I think, you know, it's, it is really worrying. Um, diversity in cropping and within the crop will really sort of help turn things around. Anna, you've spent a lot of your working life talking to farmers. You are from a farming family. What, what, what are the big challenges that you've, you hear about and that you've seen at first hand that farmers face when it comes to working with these tight margins which we talk about in terms of um, the, the, the price that people pay for, are prepared to pay for food? A lot of, I agree with a lot of what Tim has said about um, farming needing to keep up with the demand for enough food and enough affordable food and that has led among a lot of farmers I speak to to a feeling that food has become massively undervalued mm. and um, and I think they feel that from all sorts of different angles. So it comes from the consumer in the sense of, well, consumers say they want environmentally friendly food and they say they want, you know, all of these high standards. And as citizens, consumers are saying all the right things. But when they walk into the supermarket and they turn into a shopper, a shopper is very different to a citizen they shop on price mm. and they shop on what they can afford, what's on offer. And uh, the farmers are, are like, well, it's really difficult for us to farm in the face of that hypocrisy because people are not doing what they say they want. And the people that are then getting it in the neck are we as farmers. Mm. And uh, so I think they feel that food has become something that's taken for granted, that is too cheap although I think we might be going through something of a shock that might change that. We're seeing food prices going up really quickly, which is going to make people start to think about their shopping basket in a way that we just haven't had to. Mm. Food has been mm. so abundant and so cheap, we haven't even had to think about it. And even though it is worrying that food prices are going up, the benefit of it might be a little bit more thought about where it comes from how we afford it, how we value it. Um, so, yeah, a, a frustration of food being undervalued, which therefore makes farmers feel undervalued and also misunderstood, um, that they are just trashing. And, you know, if you're working on a farm every single day, you don't feel like that about your land. You feel that you cherish it and that you love it. And when someone says that you trash it and that it's not managed well and there's no life in it. Um, that's a very hard pill for many farmers to swallow because that's not the experience they have every day. So um, my thing has always been about trying to bring understanding and compassion into these discussions. Um, I heard a question earlier, actually, uh, that was, uh, what do we do about the new forest? Because it's managed so terribly. And I just thought, oh, gosh, if there was a, a tenant farmer here right now who had land in the new forest, how, how upsetting that would have been. Um, so it's about sort of, as Tim said, about understanding that this is nobody's fault mm. and uh, that we, we've just 
we've all played our part in getting into this mess. So. I, I think that's a really important point and one that we've, we've been trying to make throughout this, this talk series. It's not about attributing blame, it's more about finding solutions uh, and I, I guess also about educating. One of the really interesting things, we had Mark Shaler speaking here earlier on today, um, talking about the nutritional value relatively in our food that we eat now, perhaps a, a tomato from the 1970s compared to a tomato we might eat now, we'd need five or six times as many tomatoes to get the same nutritional value. And Joe, would you be able to sort of comment on how that, the fact that we, if we all acknowledge that the soil is being degraded for reasons that are multifaceted, but it has been and is now considerably less fertile than it was 50 years ago, is that fair? And, and what's been the knock-on effect to the, the actual quality of the food that's produced? Well, we're we're farming really from inputs now um, to get these huge yields. Across the board, uh, I think they've been looking at nutritional value of food um, since 1940. And across the board, vegetables, meat, fruit, um, everything we eat, the nutritional value has gone down by about 40%. And this is mainly due to wanting increased yields. Mm. But we're farming, um, we're putting in... Um, manufactured inputs, manufactured fertilisers. So the plant actually then stops, switches off and just goes, OK, spoon feed me. And it's not actually picking up the minerals and nutrients that um, it would do in a, a natural environment. And also, when you're spoon feeding plants like that, they get sort of big and lush and green and glossy. They become more attractant to insects and fungus. So therefore they're more prone to disease so you have to throw more at them to keep them healthy so it's again we're back on a yeah it's, it's a, essentially a, it's, a cycle. it's the same for meat um and there's some really interesting research um around i think it's newcastle university where they've been looking at nutritional quality of meat and nutritional quality of meat varies a lot um, and if it's grass fed if it's 100 percent pasture fed it tends to have more um, omega oils and more nutrients and it's it's it's, it's got a much greater range in it but there's a graph i've seen which basically the amount of plants the ca cattle are grazing and the amount of nutrients in it and it sort of rises in keeping with the number of plants so if you've got just rye grass there's not much nutritional value and also that meat is being produced from one plant basically if you've got a wildflower meadow with 30 40 50 species of plant each one of those will be contributing something different to it so there's more nutritional value the more plants they're eating and that's really important Important because it's very positive because actually that proves that conservation grazing which is less productive in terms of the amount of meat you get per acre but it's much better in terms of nutrition I think it's a really important point that some people are suggesting we shouldn't you know, we should change how we value food if you if you analyze it per nutritional unit you get a very different equation than if it's just by the kind of the number of kilograms of meat or, or, or carbohydrate or anything else so I think there's good news in that as people wake up to the kind of nutritional value of agroecologically regeneratively produced food actually it's worth paying a little bit more and it's is i just think it changed our relation to it it's not just fuel it's something to be treasured to be savored with different flavors more nutrition and i think for me that's a really a positive thing about the way we're hopefully moving with our agriculture now it's really interesting so it's essentially a false economy that we've created all this idea that you buy cheap that it's you know you can get lots of cheap food and therefore you're going to feed your families or, or whatever it might be but essentially you're you're giving yourself something that you need to have more of to actually you need to pay you're going to pay more for it essentially in the long term if you buy quality food that's slightly more expensive it's actually something that you can uh, it's going to feed you for longer and, and give you better taste as well presumably yeah i mean certainly with meat i think it's just about re redefining our relationship with meat and meat should be an occasional treat mm. and it might cost a little bit more and we need to eat a lot less of it and dairy as well mm -hmm. because the amount of grain we use all over the world, 40% of the world's grain harvest is fed to animals, which is bonkers. So if we eat less meat and dairy and just have it as an occasional treat or to add flavour to other dishes, that's a much, it's much, so it's just about changing that whole relationship. Meat's my sort of thing with Farm Wilder, but I think the same applies to other things. Just changing our relationship with food in a way that's better for the, for the environment, better for us. And what sort of response would you would you have encountered from farmers who would where were you saying, well, we need to eat less meat? What, I mean, that's a conversation that lots of us are having. It's certainly a conversation we're having within my family. Um, but 
Does that also feel like in some way an attack on farming? Oh, it's a, oh God, it's incendiary. Right. And, yeah. and I, I've been caught in its crossfire repeatedly because uh, I agree that we um, don't need to eat meat at the levels we currently do in, in fat countries like ours where we have so much. I mean, you know, we, the fat West, this idea that, we, you know, meat has become such a cheap commodity that we can just shove it into our gobs without even thinking about it. And uh, that wasn't true for my grandparents' generation. They actually really valued me and made a chicken last all week and made a, you know, a shoulder of lamb, you know, Nan could make it last all week. So, I mean, you know, this is a relatively new way of thinking about meat as something I should be able to have three times a day and for 99p on a sandwich. That's my right. And, you know, that we haven't always thought like that. And I do think that we should dial back our sort of expectation that meat should be part of every meal and I really don't I don't see why that is so threatening and it but to a lot of farmers I speak to the, you you can't have that conversation without it turning into a row um, because I think it's wrapped up in some weird kind of culture war I think they see it as a threat to their way of life their livelihood their identity I think more importantly um, and it's, it's a shame because it's a very pure message that means no harm and means no threat to anyone because I think that we don't need to lose our livestock farmers just because we're eating less meat. Um, but I think that it has been handled so badly by the media, by activist groups, by... I'm sorry to say the V word, but I think by some of the more activist vegans, they have just gone in there like a bull in a china shop and have just upset the apple cart so much that the farmers have got a blind spot now. It's just a total, I can't have this conversation. I feel so attacked. I feel so undervalued. I feel like you just think we're all wrecking the planet and we're making everyone ill with heart disease and that we're causing climate change. So I can't <coughs> even have the conversation anymore. And we've got to we've got to unravel that. So I think before we can start having positive action on changing diets, we first got to unravel the cultural clash that's happened and kind of try and unpick it a little bit and take a step back and introduce a lot, a lot more empathy and compassion into the space because the amount, I've had huge debates with farmers and they get very, they, they end up saying really ridiculous things. Like I had one debate and I was saying that everyone should have a meat free meal every week, not even a day, a meal. And um, one thumped the table and said, I want kids to eat beef for breakfast. <laughs> and another one said, what about bodybuilders? They need meat every day. And I was like, I don't want kids eating beef for breakfast and I'm pretty sure a bodybuilder could manage a day without meat. And, but it's got to this ridiculous space mm. and this is, we've, we've got to get past that thing, that toxic thing. And once we're over that, I think that it'll be okay. I'm, I'm just thinking out loud here, but I mean, is, is part of this, uh, coming back to that point about diversity I and mean, Joe talking about I mean, talking about the diversity of what farmers actually farm. I mean, if you if you farm chickens, cows, sheep, pigs, and thinking back to how farms perhaps used to look 50, 60 years ago, uh, you can have a broader conversation because a conversation about one point of that farm isn't just necessarily an attack on. You know, you can talk about different things mm. essentially. It, it, our, our farm, what do farms look like now compared to 50 years ago? Well, they're less diverse they've all special they've had to specialize because they've been put under pressure we needed it was economics and you specialize so I mean, i've been doing some work um, i'm from somerset we're looking at a triple si which is uh king sedgemore which is full of phosphates and then i'm looking around and there are like five dairy farms draining into that that triple si so all just milking. for the audience could you a triple SI being? Uh, a site of science, uh, special scientific interest. They're wetlands. Um, so critical yeah. spaces for nature and, and ecosystem. Um, and all of those farms are milking way over 800 cows each. Mm -hmm. um, so you've got a huge nutrient burden there because cows um, 
produce byproducts, um, slurry, and they haven't got enough land to put it on. So you've got these really uh, nutrient-rich farms um, where you've got livestock, where they've had to increase their livestock for economics, and then you've got arable farms where they haven't got any cows and they're buying in, having to buy in um, nutrients. So I think what I am trying to do, or is my big thing now, is to get increased diversity on farms. And if they can't do it as a business by themselves, it's cooperative working. So, you know, somebody else come in and grow some grass on an arable farm or maybe import some manure to do the soils, to, to help the soils where you've just had um, chemical inputs. So to increase diversity, really, mm. in the crop rotation. Um, you know, in the 60s, we didn't have problems with soils as they are now because gra Dr Green grass was always in the crop rotation and those soils were given a bit of a rest mm. um, occasionally, probably for about three years, but um, it just helps them recover and regenerate a little bit. Tim, can you paint a picture of the Farm Wilder farming group and the type of farms that you're involved with and, and, and perhaps a slightly different picture to that um, monoculture type farming that we've become accustomed to? Yeah, we've got, um, we've got two farm groups. So our largest farm group is around Dartmoor and uh, South Devon. And we've got a load of upland farmers who have got, um, we work with them because they've got really endangered wildlife. So they've got things like marsh fritillaries, which I've got a picture of somewhere here. Um, I can find it. And the whole, the whole thing about farm wildlife is how do we reward farmers for having exceptional wildlife? So that butterfly, the marsh fritillary, um, it's very endangered, just grows in boggy meadows on Dartmoor and eats devil bit scabious, particular wildflower. And most farms don't have that. We've chosen a bunch of farms who've got that or they've got cuckoos. And we started out by marketing their meat on the basis that they've got cuckoos. So cookie, fr cookie friendly beef and lamb, fritillary butterfly beef. So we're trying to basically add value through the wildlife they've got, try to make wildlife more of a conversation about the food we, we, we get. So these farms, they're very good for wildlife and they're on Dartmoor, they have upland areas which are extensive grazing where there's lots of wildlife and they have lower areas on the farm where they're typically a bit more intensive. And we work with them over time to boost the wildlife and to make the rest of the farm more sustainable. So we do things like rather than have a ryegrass meadow that produces some of their silage or they graze the, the cattle on when they're not on the, on the higher areas, they plant um, herbal lays which are basically kind of artificial wildflower meadows with maybe 15 or 20 species, much better. Don't need to put nutrients in via fertilizers because legumes do that, clovers. There are plants like chicory that bring nutrients from deep underground. So it's a whole system of farming, 100% pasture fed, no artificial fertilizers needed because nature does it for you, pretty much. So um, it's, it, it, it's great and there's wonderful wildlife there. We also have some farms in the lowlands that are finishing farms where the cattle get sold to, to be finished in winter. And again, they use these herbal lays and there's wonderful wildlife. So one of our farms, which is um, quite near Plymouth, has got these herbal lays and the cattle stay out all year round, rotationally grazing or mob grazing. So every day the farmer moves the electric fence a little bit further, the cattle move on to a fresh bit of grass and some fresh bale, bales of, of, of hay. Um, and what's great about this farm is it's got masses of wildlife because you've got all these different plants there, because it's not just ryegrass. You've got these herbal lays, you've got in summer you'll get insects pollinating them, things eating the seeds. And in winter, they've got a bird called the cattle egret, which has just colonised the UK over the last 20 years. And it's perfect for them because in winter, there's not many bugs around. But if you go to a, um, one of these farms where there's a load of cows, even in January, there's still flies around and they, because of the dung and the, and the cows. So these cattle egrets are recolonising Britain thanks to farms like that, which have got really rich biodiversity and lots of insects for them. So it's, it's an amazing bunch of farms. I mean, they are really... It's, it's unlike anything you would see you know, if, you, if you go to your regular farm, I drove past one on the way here in the Mendips and it's just complete lawn of ryegrass and whoever owns it has actually got weed killer and sprayed the lane outside so all the wildflowers, the mm. cow pasta on the verge, have been sprayed. It doesn't even graze that. I thought, why? Is that just tidiness? It just, there's a mentality thing which I think on Dartmoor you can't do that so I think people are a bit more, are kind of a bit more open to biodiversity and we're just basically rewarding them by paying, paying them a higher price because they've got great biodiversity because they're being more sustainable so that's what we do we have a farm group we pay them a higher price typically 30 40 pence a kilo extra and when we market the meat um, with the wildlife telling the story of the wildlife and say to people if you buy this meat you're supporting wildlife you're supporting biodiversity 
and you can guarantee that that steak you buy or that lamb shoulder is helping all these rare wildlife. Anna, you're nodding your head there, and it's uh, certainly a, a Tim was painting a picture that I definitely recognise as well because I saw almost an identical thing uh, just down the road from where I live in, in, in South West Wiltshire uh, last week. But it, the idea of sort of obsessive tidiness and sort of having to present the farm in a certain way seems to come up time and time again here. It's sort of the pride of farming mm. sometimes comes in how the farm's presented. Do, is, how do we sort of, where does that come from and, and how do we start to kind of unpick it? Well, that's, that's deep, in, deep in the culture. That's deep in the bones of farmers. Um, my granddad was a really tidy farmer and he took great pride in it because he was known locally. So, oh, Bill Jones got a nice farm. You know, it always keeps it nice and tidy and it shows that, you, it shows that you're there, you're present, you're, you're giving your land and your animals and your buildings and your machinery attention. And that is a matter of pride because you know other farmers are driving around looking over your hedges and if you start letting it go it's a signal to other farmers in your community that things might not be so well in the old bank account and that's not an, that's not a signal you want to give to your peers in your community so you know there's a that culture has got to be tweaked and uh, and I think it probably is because it's like, oh, he's probably doing some of that rewilding stuff. But, you know, that, that's probably starting to become part of the, the conversation now. But You're, you're noticing yes. farmers having more conversations about oh, rewilding. Yes. The rewilding conversation is Yes, is, is yes, yeah. yeah. Um, farmers are, in, are really, you know, want, want, if you go into a conversation openly and you sort of converse without any agenda, you realise farmers are incredibly progressive. Mm. They know this stuff. They see it. They work... They work outdoors and with nature a lot more than I do. I spend my life at a laptop. You know, they, they are in it every day. They know, they know this stuff. So once you take the debate or the battle out of it, you agree on most things. And they're incredibly knowledgeable about nature. Um, you know, my dad, growing up, he always used to say, you know, a town person has street names as their roadmap. We have the trees and flowers. And it was like, you should know what all the trees are call, called because that's our roadmap. That's, you know, so, you know, and he's a conventional farmer, but it's deep in his bones to understand nature. Um, but he's a farmer, so he comes at things slightly differently to a conservationist. Do you think but all on, farms are like that? Because I sometimes well, get a picture of farmers sitting in a tractor cab or a combine harvester cab in East Anglia, combining the music on and not really, ne hardly ever getting out. I mean, do you think... Do you think the level well, of I mean, awareness East of nature is... I mean, I'm from the West. I'm from the borders with Wales. So, you know, that's hilly beef mm. and lamb country. Beef and lamb country is very different to great, you know, wheat and barley country over in the East. But um, I don't know. I do know um, a farmer in, in the East who said when he was all arable, he said he didn't really feel embedded in his farm because he, he very much felt that he was above it looking down on it because he was in the tractor a lot of the time. But then when he reintroduced cattle into the arable rotation and into the system grazing herbal lays he, he was at physical ground level sort of boots on ground and he suddenly felt very different about his farm because he was in it so I think you know what that that probably is a point but quickly on road verges my, my sister's a, a conservationist she works for bug life and uh, she started going around the farms in our local area and chatting with them about not mowing their verges and like knocking on doors, being like, why do you mow your verge? Do you, would you be up for not mowing it <laughs> or not mowing it at this time of year? And, um, you know, she's actually having quite a lot of success with that because it is just about, you know, looking nice. It's, it's an easy win as well, isn't it? Because ultimately that mowing process in itself, you're using carbon, yeah. you're using energy, you're using people power. It's, farmers are working hard enough. They don't they can just leave those verges, I suppose. But, Joe, I mean, talking about pride in appearance and perhaps a kind of misplaced um, idea of what is beautiful, what is attractive, you know, control and manicured lawns everywhere. We're all kind of guilty of it, aren't we, in terms of the way we garden? We were just talking about... You haven't seen my garden. <laughs> 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 I think my big bugbear are hedges. Um, yeah. Hedges uh, produce some um, flowers this time of year and then they will fruit. But 
they will only flower on growth um, on growth that's been grown for two years. So if you cut your hedge every year, they're never going to flower and never going to produce any fruit. And those hedges are like the larder for mm. so many um, fa farm animals, particularly birds. And what has that hedge ever done to you to be mowed down to about this high and square? Mm. And infield trees is my other thing as well. I like. There's a farmer near me who's got some oak trees, beautiful, I mean, it must have been Parkland, obviously where fields have been divided years ago, but beautiful trees, and then they're like sowing maize right up to the tree trunk, and you sort of walk out with the farm and say, look, nothing's grown here, what has this tree ever done to you? It's been here for a lot longer, mm -hmm. uh, you know, more, um, you know, and it's going to give a lot, a lot more than your lifespan. So just leave it, you know, what has this tree done? Um, and you're not getting any productivity from, mm. from that area. So I think it's sort of, sometimes they do get, a, some farmers do get a bit detached. And what we're finding mm. also is a lot of ground is now being rented to third parties and maybe they're not nurturing the ground quite as well because it, it's not theirs, it's, it's not, they're not the custodian of that soil. I have noticed a lot of the hedges around home are looking really gappy. Yes. Because they've just been cut and cut and cut and cut and they're not, you've got to give them breathing space. Yeah. You have to restore them. You have to either kind of let them grow out and lay them or cut them back to coppice and cut let them start them, again. Because yeah. I, I see them in Wales loads. You see where they used to, you see a bush in the middle of a field. You know, it's a long, thin bush. It was once a hedge and it's just been trimmed and trimmed until it's just, most of it's died mm. out. and. Yeah, fencing yeah. takes care of the livestock, keeping them in But I think field. the other thing that we have to um, realise, though, is there are a lot less people employed on the land now. So, mm -hmm. you know, a farm used to have several employees and somebody would have mm -hmm. a job of hedge laying, maintaining the hedges on a rotational basis. And now, you know, on the farms, it may be just the farmer and one worker or a farmer using outside contractors. We just get a contractor in and they just go and lop it all off. Mm -hmm. Like, there's... Don't care. If you're a contractor, you don't really know that particular bit of hedge. So. It was interesting, yeah, we went to Perkwood Organic. In fact, Perkwood Organic have got a, a stand in the um, in the botanical market. And even they, it's a wonderful farm, very much. Uh, it's not, I wouldn't say perhaps the description that Tim's made, but they're, they're trying to present nature or protect, preserve nature. Uh, it's as nature. good as arable gets. Yeah. I visited it. And oh, it's got yeah. the highest population of corn buntings in the UK or something. Yeah. I mean, it's absolutely aston astonishing. I get all my muesli and porridge oats from there. And they're the closest thing I've seen in Arable to what we do with Farm Wilder because they put the wildlife on the packets. Mm -hmm. If you look at their packets, it's all about corn buntings and mm -hmm. skylarks and, and, and all the wildlife they have there. They're a really fantastic farm, really recommend them. And they've been going for a long long time. They're making it work commercially. So it is, it is possible to, to do this without being destructive at all, at all costs. Yeah, absolutely. I think I don't know how they do it. They used to be in Sainsbury's and, and I think they just sell online, online now. Um, but I mean, they, I don't know how much of a premium. I mean, I, I'm prepared to pay more for that muesli because I know where it's come from and I know the wildlife it supports. I don't know if they're, if they're doing that and how their prices compare, but um, I mean, it, it comes back to this thing about the price of food. And it's not to say that food is, when you say pr food is too cheap, the problem with food at the moment, it doesn't reflect its full environmental cost. So we pay a certain amount for food, but then we as taxpayers pay a load more for sorting out river pollution and we'll pay for climate change, we'll pay for soil degradation. So it doesn't, it just doesn't reflect its true environmental cost. And something like that, perfect organic, you know, that muesli, that does, it's organic, wildlife friendly. If it's a bit more expensive, it's worth it because we're not having to pick up the bill later. And I guess adding things like the waste, the cost, I mean, there's and the, the cost to our, our health uh, through obesity. I mean, there's, there's all manner of knock on effects of the way that we're consuming food so cheaply with so much waste as well. I mean, it, 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 everything comes back to it. It's, it's so fascinating. And since I got into that, I mean, I, my background is not in farming at all. I'm a, a zoologist, a wildlife filmmaker, but I just became fascinated by farming, made some farming series and then thought, actually, I want to get more involved in farming as sort of wildlife and sustainability but everything comes back to farming it's amazing how little attention we pay to it given it's so important to us you know 70 percent of our land so if you want to restore wildlife in the uk the biggest thing to do is to transform farming because it's farming intensive farming that's destroyed wildlife it's farming that is starting to put it back now it's so critical to mm. diet obesity everything and yet we just take farmers for granted we take food for granted 
it's just extraordinary. And I, but I am positive. I do think there's a revolution happening. Yeah, there is. And I think I think is that you know, see more and more young people want to get into farming. I think more and more people are waking up to what we've done through farming, but also what we can do. It's it's a really positive thing. We just need to get more people to realise that you walk into that supermarket and buy the cheapest possible food. If you could afford to pay a bit more for something that's helping the farm, the farms and wildlife and the environment, then we should be doing it. We just need to spread that message because it's just tragic how, how, how degraded farming's become in this country, in the world, really. It's about valuing farmers, valuing food and valuing the the effect that it has on, on nature by, by not doing so. And I mean, Anna, if I could ask, sorry, go on. Yeah, I just wanted to say something about um, regenerative farming, mm -hmm. um, which I think is the revolution that's happening. And, and I, hear, <coughs> I hear farmers of all shapes and sizes, all sectors and systems wanting to put their shoulder to that wheel. They, they, they do believe in it. But I think in order for this to be a successful revolution that actually helps all of farming and all of food rather than just creating another niche that separates another group from the conventional mass. We've got to be with farmers through the whole journey because regenerate, making our ag agriculture regenerative is not a silver bullet and it's not a, oh, there we go, magic wand, all sorted. Mm. It's a really long journey and we've got to buckle up with the farmers and be with them along the whole way. And, because it's not going to happen overnight. Some farmers are going to get, some farmers are going to go for it hell for leather and they will go 100%. Some farmers will tiptoe around the edges a bit and do a little bit here and a little bit there and wait and see how that pays off. You know, does the fact that it's much less cost really benefit? Does it, does it really counteract the fact that I've lost yield and all these kind of things? So they will wait. And I think a good example of it is the neonicotinoid ban, which happened in 2014, which um, they found that neonicotinoids are damaging to pollinators in most scenarios. You can argue the science and say there's some scenarios where they don't, but mostly they do. They're damaging to bees and pollinators. So EU banned them. Now, immediately after that ban, there was an impact. Oilseed rape crops in some areas of the country collapsed. Some farmers came out of growing it completely and it was a bit of a kind of a mess for a lot of farmers. Um, but now, a few years on, they're starting to think their way around it. They're starting to try companion cropping so that the flea beetle that attacks the oilseed rape doesn't know that it's there because there's a companion crop in with it and it sort of confuses the pest. And they, they're applying sewage sludge and things to crops so that the pest can't smell it. So there's all these really amazing, genius ideas that farmers are thinking around it. But we have to remember that fertilizers do work. Pesticides work. They don't use them for fun, they work. And if you're gonna give them up, then you are gonna have a yield penalty. And that farmers are gonna to have to, in the same way they've done with neonics, they're gonna to have to think around those problems. So I think it's just us having the patience to sit with farmers through that journey. While they figure it out, they're gonna to have to scratch their heads, they're gonna to have to think of other things. So it's not going to happen overnight, and we've got to be aware of that. But I think we'll come out good, because the neonics, mm. like, we're fine. We're, we can, we're living without neonics, apart from the sugar beet growers, but we are. And uh, it will be fine, but it's going to be a long road. We've got to have our eyes open. And Joe, what, what role do you play in terms of, um, I mean, it's an education process for everyone, isn't it? It's not just the consumers, but it's also the farmers. But in terms of when, when Anna talks about fertilisers, working that's true but um, obviously once upon a time we were able to farm without fertilizer so mm. what, what's what's happened there um i think people have just become hooked on them obviously farmers are being are looking for output so it's like turnover we want big yields we want big yields but i think they've really sort of lot lo got a bit lost in the way they've been a bit bamboozled by the fertilizer companies as yeah. well you know, they've been producing varieties that will respond to fertilisers. So they go, oh, we're going to get a really big yield, so I'm going to use more fertilisers. But I, I've got an, I, I joined FWAG um, from commercial agronomy because it became very disillusioned with commercial agronomy. Um, and I came to look at soils, um, and I was mainly looking at soil erosion. Um, and some of those soils were completely broken, and the farmers say, well, what do you do when it pours with rain? And, 
you're just saying, well, actually, the farmer next door has had the same rainfall, same slope, same soil. It's something that you are doing. And you have to sort of, like, take them back and walk them through it and go on, as Anna said, it's a journey. You're holding their hand and sort of saying, well, I don't tell, I don't tell farmers what to do, but I sort of, the way I go in and advise them, I sort of go and say, have you ever thought about such and such? And it's like scattering a little bit of seed on the ground. And then I'll walk away and probably go back to see them two or three weeks later. And if any of those seeds have germinated, you just nurture those seeds. Mm -hmm. And because sometimes they can be like, the son might be interested, but the farmer says, no, the father says, no, we do it this way. So there's this generation mm, thing. That's a huge thing, isn't it? Mm. And yeah. it is a huge thing. So we've got like young, I mean, I'm dealing now with some young farmers that are, I went to see them and I said, well, look, you're purely arable. Your soils are losing organic matter. Um, shall we try this? Your soil structure wasn't very good. So they tried a little bit of, um, I don't know, lifted the soil. So they did some um, mechanical intervention. Then they started incorporating some straw. Then they started growing some cover crops. Then they thought, oh, well. And cover crops are a green crop, which is just put on ground, which should normally be left bare over the winter. So it's a sort of just to keep the ground covered. Then they started grazing those cover crops with sheep, using a neighboring farmer. Now they've bought their own sheep. And now they're actually planting clover onto the ground as a sort of like a living mulch and they're just direct drilling their normal arable things into this clover so you've got always green um, undercover but that doesn't happen overnight mm. i've been working with these people for five or six years mm. and it's just like little give them small chunks but but critical point i guess is that the soil can recover from that degradation it can the find soil can itself. recover yeah. very very quickly one of actually the golden bullet or the silver bullet is actually herbal lays or mm. grass, Dr. Green. Um, but I'm seeing amazing results from herbal lays in an arable situation. Tim, in some of the farms that you've worked with, um, can you give, have you got some evidence of the quality of the soil that's, um, that's in, in place there through, throughout not using uh, fertilizers and artificial inputs? Um, I mean, it's, it's it's very different on Dartmoor because those areas haven't been intensively farmed, so they've got the kind of original sort of soil. Yeah. It's more, I guess, some of our some of our finishing farms are quite exciting. The one I was talking about before that's got the cattle egrets near Plymouth. I mean, that was heavily um, heavily um, farmed, arable, and the soil is starting to recover very quickly. I mean, it's, it's amazing how quickly nature does respond. We've also got a farm we've worked with just near Chew Lake, um, uh, a guy called Luke Hazel, uh, also runs a butcher's there. And his farm, his dad, had farmed it really intensively with arable. He's basically put it to herbal lays, and he's also restored several wildflower meadows. He's worked at the Avon Wildlife Trust. And these wildflower meadows are incredible. I mean, we talk about, you know, people talk in hallowed, sort of reverent terms about wildflower meadows and how they're so special, and we've lost 95%, 97% of them, which is true. But actually, 10 years into this project, some of his wildflower meadows are incredible, and they're full of daisies and all sorts of other plants, oxide daisies, really diverse, full of butterflies, full of other bugs. Nature comes back incredibly quickly. I mean, it's like with tigers in India. I mean, 10 years ago, like, tigers are going extinct. It's desperate. I mean, tigers breed like rabbits. Give them, give them deer to eat and a bit of space, and they will bounce straight back. And that is the story of nature generally. It's incredibly resilient. There's so much... I've got so much positivity about British farming now. For the farms I work with, the farms I hear about, in this sort of bubble of agroecology or regenerative farming, wildlife is bouncing back. I think there's a lag period. I think there'll be another... You know, five years or so, maybe ten years. But I think those graphs that have been going down all my life of wildlife declining, I think they're going to start coming back up because we're really seeing a turnaround. And if we can get that on a large scale, it's going to be amazing. And it, it, you know, all the forget the doom and gloom. I do think we're going to have a much better country than we currently have. Mm. Um, it's amazing how it's coming back. Anna, that's an, that is a positive and exciting message. I mean, what's your sense on, on what Tim just been saying? Oh, I agree completely. I think we're. Uh... I think we're at the beginning of the up, and um, because it's because some of the divisions that have kept that have held us back um, are starting to sort of come together. So when I first started at the BBC covering rural affairs, that was back in two thousand six, quite a long time ago now. 
And um, I remember covering the Oxford Farming Conference and the Oxford Real Farming Conference, which are the two big agricultural events in Oxford every January. And the Oxford Farming Conference traditionally was big landowners, agribusiness, the more sort of conventional, larger scale businesses. And the Oxford Real Farming Conference is for organic, alternative, smaller farms. And back then, they were just rivals. There was no communication between them. They absolutely hated each other. They rolled their eyes at each other, had, thought the other had absolutely no value or anything to, to offer the world. And now we're seeing these two, um, they, they team up and, and they organise events together. There's a lot of cross-pollination, I hate that term, but there is. And uh, they're, they're all kind of... Um, you know, they're teaming up and you're seeing it with the regenerative movement as well. Rather than, oh, you're a conventional farmer, you go over there. You're an organic farmer, you go over there. The regenerative movement, the agroecological movement is bringing these groups together in a really united way. And uh, this whole idea that you've got these divided camps of agriculture, I think is being deconstructed. And, and broken down and it's it's the job of us that live in our towns and cities to catch up with that because we're not seeing farming all the time there can be a temptation among commentators who are more urban to think that these divided worlds are still as they've always been and to try and perpetuate an idea of division um, but actually there's it's so exciting working with farmers and conservationists these di these days is the most rewarding thing because they they're singing from the same hymn sheet increasingly not completely and i'm not saying they are there's a long way to go but more than i've seen in my time that i've been covering rural affairs for sure joe in terms of the uh talking about the, the degradation of, of soil but in the, the decline of biodiversity which we all recognize there's a very very significant extinction going on um very optimistic words from the two panellists either side of you. Do you see, do you have that optimism as well that we can turn the tide here and, um, and that we can regenerate and rejuvenate our soils enough to enable nature? We're going to have to. Um, I probably, I work for FWAG anyway, um, so I really want to see this. Um, that's my job. Uh, but farmers are, um, and I think it's when they sort of see that first corn bunting or whatever, they're on the phone and saying, we've just had a survey, we've had this. I mean, it is really rewarding when you're seeing people who perhaps are a little bit reticent to do things and then they, you know, nature does pop back, um, as Luke said. Um, and they just love it. You know, they get hooked on it. Um, and there are, I mean, I do care where my food comes from. We do have to feed a growing population. And, but there are certain marginal areas of the farm where they are um, maybe trying to farm it and losing money on that. So if you break that down into economics and just say, look, this bit is never going to, this is losing you money to try and cultivate it, put inputs on, but this would be a really good nature habitat. So, you know, make space for nature. Um, and the, the two can go together. Mm. I think, I mean, the, the thing that's tricky for me is, is that how disconnected people are from where their food comes from. Yep. And I was thinking it really struck me reading Anna's book is, is that you know, it's such a fascinating fault line that runs through our country in everything, in politics, in um, food eating habits, in, in work ethic, all sorts of things are divided between town and country. And for me, that's a problem because we're trying to, I'm try, basically trying to say to an urban population, if you buy this food and support these farmers, you'll make the countryside better. So we're always trying to reach out to people and make them care about where the food comes from and how it's grown. And I, I think that's the thing that I think we have to really tackle because we are so urbanised now. There's always this tendency for us to drift away from the countryside and where our food comes from. And I just, I mean, I'm very encouraged that there's now going to be a GCSE in natural history. I think that's an important step. Mm. I think it's, I think it's important that education is so at the heart of it to try and bridge that divide and get people onto farms, get kids onto farms, get people growing food themselves. It's just anything that breaks down that divide because that's what our biggest barrier is: the farm wild. They're trying to get people to support our farmers. It's that lack of awareness about conservation, about sustainability. 
And I, I think at the moment we're in a state where it's quite fashionable to be into where your food comes from. And I think, how do we sustain that for the long haul? Yeah. What do we mm. do to our society so that, you know, do we get more people out onto land again? Do we, you know, do we value it to the point that people, I don't know, how do we, I was out for a walk the other day, I met some people who were just setting up like a community agriculture project near Cardiff. And they're like, we're going to grow vegetables and set up a box scheme. And more and more of those things are happening. But I think we just need to get people back on the land, into nature, onto farms, and to try and stop that divide yeah. between the sort of urban people and country people ever happening again. Because that's what's killed us, really. And that's what we need to solve, I think. I agree. I think it's a, and I think it's a fantastic point to finish on, Tim. So thank you very much. Uh, really fascinating, I think, conversation there about... Uh, the future of farming and what's what's gone wrong but also some really positive um, sounds about how we can regenerate nature and, and, and enable uh, nature in a very different way to perhaps the last 40 50 years bex there's got a, a mic in her hand I, I appreciate uh, a lot of the audience uh, listened uh, attentively there if there's any questions from the audience please uh, please feel free to to put them our way yes i think um it's easy to farm with chemicals and sprays, there's been an educational gap. What are the uh, agricultural colleges doing about it? Are they going on the same mantra of spray it and fertilize it, or are they taking seriously the land? It's a good, good question. question. Mm. Who'd like to take that, Joe? Yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think with the increasing popularity of regenerative farming, um, these modules are now being brought in. I'm sorry, I haven't been... It was a long time ago I was at college, um, and I'm, I don't really go into colleges. Um, certainly, when I was doing agronomy and I came in to do soils, um, I was having a bit of an argument with somebody from the Environment Agency saying, oh, the agronomists should look after the soils. And I actually had to say to him, when I was an agronomist, I wasn't taught anything about soils. I was taught about chemicals. Yeah. Um, so on the basis of that argument, all of the agronomists who are out selling agrochemicals were then had to go through and learn about soils. So I think it will, they will catch up. Um, but it's, um, it's coming. But I mean, soil biology, we didn't know anything about soil biology when I was at university. Um, we learned about soil structure and cation exchange and bits and pieces like that. But we knew nothing about soil biology and we still know very little about soil biology. So I think as we discover more, that Harper. information will, be, will diffuse out. Harper Adams in Shropshire has got an ecology course now. Cause my, my sister was invited to go and speak to students at Harper Adams. And uh, I thought, and bearing in mind my cousin who did a... a auctioneering and land management at Harper only less than 10 years ago and it was you would not no. catch an ecologist or a conservationist talking to students at Harper that's happening now um, and I think it's true at Sirencester as well Royal College of, uh, yes actually a colleague of mine from FWAG um, yeah. actually lectures at um, Royal Agricultural uh, yeah, yeah Royal Agricultural thing so um, yeah it's happening Good to hear. Catching Any other up. questions from the audience at all? Gentleman at the back. Yeah, hi. Uh, is that on? <laughs> yeah, hi. Yep. Um, I watched, I came to this a bit late, this uh, talk, so apologies if you've covered this topic already. But I watched um, a, bit of a fascinating programme last week on um, meat production or the role of um, uh, meat production in America and how if you get um, the sustainable feeding throughout the, uh, the grassland, you can actually start sequestering large amounts of carbon Upgrade. from the atmosphere. And it was really in stark contrast to some of the sort of headlines recently about um, meat um, consumption causing huge amounts of carbon um, output so it, it it just struck me have you covered this on, in this particular topic about the role of um sustainable meat production well, it's a it's a really good question mm. anna is that one for you because I, I i i noticed on twitter that you had a bit of a, a an exchange around um uh, the, the the role of meat in in um the amount of carbon that's in the atmosphere is that something you'd like to tackle 
Did I call not? Um, well, we, know, <laughs> we, know that, uh, we know that pasture locks up carbon from the atmosphere and is a really good carbon sink. Um, at p permanent pasture, meadows. Um, I, ooh, I, I was about to say can store more carbon than trees. Do you know if that's right? I think I've heard, you can. Yeah, yeah I, I, that's ringing a bell somewhere. Recess in my brain. And um, America, I'm just really... So the US has really become the bad boy of meat production. And it's like, well, you know, we are large, doing a lot of grass-based meat production here in the UK. Not as much 100% grass-fed, but we are rearing a lot of beef and lamb that has elements of, of grass-based forage in their diet. And then not like those dirty Americans that have just got a load of feedlots. And it's just a really interesting thing because I've, sp I've spent a lot of time traveling around the Midwest. And actually the, the beef production system in the US um, though bigger, though more intensive, the cow-calf operations are actually grass-based on the prairies. And it's family farms, ranchers living very close to the land, often still operating on horseback, so not burning fossil fuels by driving quad bikes and trailers and tractors around, um, producing beef on native prairie grasses. So, and then they go into the feedlots to get finished and fattened and that's where the problem is. So we have reduced meat production down to such a simplistic binary discussion of we're putting all the grain into the cows that we could eat ourselves when we're forgetting that actually grass is still a huge part of producing our meat. And, uh, and it does, in the carbon cycle, it does sort of sequester the carbon in the soil. So my point is, we need to make people aware of the service of pasture because it is this stuff is the most mind bogglingly brilliant thing, Dr. Green, Dr. as Green. you call it. Yeah. And we can't eat it. And but cows and sheep can. And by eating it, they turn it into milk and meat that we can eat. But also by, uh, you know, pooing on it they're returning the carbon back to the soil and it's just wonderful cycle and it is so simple it's so miraculous it's so natural that we've got ruminants that have evolved with nature to perform that service that we can then benefit from by getting protein from it and I'm like how have we how have we missed it how have we missed that in the discussion because it is so important I don't know yeah. what, what do you guys think well I mean, we were looking at the, um, I mean, I have some vegan friends too. We don't want to eat protein. I mean, I mean, a lot of the countryside around here, okay, we could allow it to rewild, but some of it is not suitable for growing combinable crops or vegetables or whatever. So, yeah, I think, I mean, the trouble, rewilding is a really interesting one because it sounds very exciting and sexy, especially to an urban light, light like me. You think, oh, great, let's turn it all over to wilderness. But the reality is, if, say, Dartmoor, where our farmers are, where the farm wilder meat comes from generally, if you rewild Dartmoor, that means returning it to closed canopy woodland, because that's what it will revert to. Now, closed canopy woodland is not that good for wildlife, ultimately. Do We don't necessarily need more of it. What we need is a mosaic of habitats, where you've got um, a, a mixture of open areas, marshy areas, trees, scrub, all these different habitats. That's the best thing for wildlife. And the only way we can get that through re rewilding, we could do it, but we'd need to have moose, we'd need to have bison, we'd need to have deer, we'd need to have wild boar, we'd need lynx, we'd need wolves. We could do that. I'd love to see that. If we turn Dartmoor into that sort of habitat, I'd be, the, I'd be absolutely delighted. But it's unrealistic, mainly because it's privately owned. But actually, given that we can't introduce wolves to Dartmoor, and it is all privately owned, we can't properly rewild Dartmoor. Therefore, the next best thing is a kind of managed rewilding where farmers play the role of the wolf. And that's what our farmers do. They have scrub, they have woodland, some have wood pasture, there's meadows, bogs, and they still get meat off it. So that extensive system of meat production is much better for wildlife than rewilding, and it produces food, and it puts carbon in the ground. So I think people, it's too binary. People think that meat is bad. The reality is meat is like electricity. You get meat, which is the equivalent of from coal-fired power stations. That's feedlot beef or... You know, dairy can be like that as well, just too intensive, too many animals, too many nutrients being produced and going to rivers. But meat can be like renewable meat, effectively, like renewable energy. And if we get that right, we can have our cake and eat it, we can have our meat and eat it. We can have good quality meat, better for us, 
and actually really good for wildlife. You know, if we lose all the grazing, all the beef, then we lose all the orchids, a lot of the butterflies, a lot of the skylarks, so much wildlife will go. And that's why we work with farmers to effectively, so just to be more nature friendly. It's a form of rewilding, but not the whole thing, but actually it's, it's, it's better. So if you eat farm wilder beef, it's actually you're helping the environment. So I'll just say to everyone here, if you want, if you want any, I have to also have to get the salesman because um, we, the more meat boxes we sell, the more meat we sell, the more farmers we can bring into the scheme, the more wildlife we can have. So come and get a, a flyer that gets you 10% off your first order. Order Anna's book because it's absolutely <laughs> brilliant. I mean, I read it very thoroughly and I think it's wonderful. It's so important. It touches on so many vital issues in, in the UK, even beyond the countryside and farming. So buy that book, get some. Um, thing, and then you'll learn about what's right for the countryside. Yeah. You'll get to help directly by buying the meat, and that will sort a lot of problems out. What are you <laughs> selling, Joe? Uh, uh, Join Flag. <laughs> <laughs> and if you need any PR and marketing services, then Tim Martin's also your man. So, I'm, what a brilliant way to, to finish this talk. I think it's been absolutely fascinating. I'm so um, absolutely um, thankful and grateful to our, our group of panelists, uh, Anna Jones on the end. Uh, Anna will be uh, doing a book signing of her fantastic book that Tim's just described um, in our Fold Bookshop after after this talk. So please join Anna over there. To Joe Oborn from FWAG and from t for Tim uh, from Farm Wilder, thank you guys so much. And thank you all for, for watching this uh, Save Our Soil talk. Just leaves it for me to say, um, if you've enjoyed this talk and if you've enjoyed indeed the rest of the event here, Planted Country event, please go to our website and register, subscribe to our newsletter, www.planted hyphencommunity.co.uk um, Thank you so much to uh, the National Trust for hosting here, us here at this wonderful venue. Thank you to Voilock for providing me with these fabulous boots that have kept my feet dry when I turned up with their trainers this morning. Um, you can, they're just amongst our, our brilliant brands in the, uh, in the botanical market. We've got amazing sustainable furniture brands in our natural living space. There's wellness workshop, lots of local food and drink. I'm probably going to head to the uh, Pilton uh, and uh, Westcombe Dairy Charcuterie Bar, uh, supported by Colchar as well. There's, there's lots here. It's our year one event. We're so grateful for you uh, supporting what we're doing with Planted. We hope to come back for many years to come. And it's with the support of uh, brilliant speakers like these three next to me um, that we're going to take this forward. So thanks for your time and we really look, uh, enjoy the rest of the event. Thank you.